weeks, the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostle. I have titled this series, The Power and the Results of a Praying Church. The Power and Results of a Praying Church. In Acts chapter 4, let's lift up verse 24 for the sake of reading and time. Acts chapter 4 and verse 24. And then after we lift up a word of prayer, bid everybody a great big God bless you. Then we'll take our seat and we'll move on to the next passage of scripture. For the sake of the reading of our base scripture, let's read Acts chapter 4 and verse 24. Let's read it together. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Father, let the words of our mouths and meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And now bless us in our time together. We ask it in Jesus' name. And if you're in agreement with that, everybody give a thunder and say amen. amen. On the way down, give somebody a great big God bless you. All right, Sister Brown, good to see your sisters here today. God bless you all. Good to see you. Good to have you here in our service today. What month is this? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How many of y'all have been praying for breast cancer victims and thanking God for those who have survived? Amen. Let's continue to lift them up in our prayers. Let's pause for just a few minutes of silence for those uh, persons as we commemorate and celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Let's pause for a few minutes of silent prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Sister Tita, your granddaughter, sit right there beside you. Have her to stand up, please. Have that lady to stand up. I want to commend her. I don't want to put her on the spot. I just want to commend her. I went to the uh, Pine and Grove yesterday for the uh, Forsyth County Sunday School Union Youth Explosion. And I had the gracious privilege of sitting at the table with this young lady and her brother and Shaquid and uh, Terrell and, uh, and uh, Tyreek. All these young folk were sitting at the table where I was sitting. And uh, people were coming by talking about the Wartownians, the first Wartownians. <laughs> and one lady came by and uh, talked about she was going to go back and tell her pastor uh, how important it is to have a relationship with the young people. And I said, well, thank you. She said, I've just been sitting observing that. How all of these young folk flock to this table to sit with you. And I, she said, this is the thing that I've been saying to my pastor. You've got to have a relationship with the young folk. And I, I thanked her again. I didn't know that she was observing. Stand up, baby. But when we all got through, when we all got through eating, this young lady got up and started cleaning the table off where we were eating. She took everybody's plate and cut and threw it in the garbage. And uh, one of our young fellows, I believe it was Caleb, who was uh, talking and moving. And he knocked over his tea. And she went and got a rag and some napkins and came back like a little lady and cleaned up the table and just treated everybody royal. And I want y'all to give her a hand for that.
Wow. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. I have titled this message, this series, The Power and the Results of a Praying Church. The Power and the Results of a Praying Church. I've given you point number one, and I've been dealing with it and working on it now for the last few weeks. Point number one is simply this, that when the church prays, the presence of God is and will be perceived. Simply point number one, that when the church really Praise. The presence of God will be and is perceived. You will know his presence. You will recognize that he has showed up. You're going to perceive the presence of God when the church seriously praise. Let's go to John chapter 6 because that's where I left off the last time we were together. John chapter 6 and while you're turning to that and speaking of the last time that we were together, let me along with our president of the Pastor's Aid Ministry and all of the members of that ministry along with myself, let me thank you for making our anniversary last week what you made it. I had a great time with you all weekend. Had a great time with our youth and our young people. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all of you for your contributions and your gifts. And those of you who had absolutely nothing to give, I want to thank you for your love and for your prayers. I had some people to come up a little later on and say, Pastor, I wanted to come up and say something, but I didn't have anything to give. Let me tell you, don't do that again. If you don't have anything to give and you want to come up and say something, you come up and say something. It's not about what you give, but it is about your love and your concern and your prayers. I know that we are living in a very, very economical crunch. And I know it's tough for a lot of people. And I want to thank you all for your giving and for those of you that made the sacrifice to give, I want to thank you. But let me tell you, those of you that couldn't give absolutely anything, let me thank you for all of the love that you give. And let me thank you for all of your prayers and all of your support and all of your concern for your pastor and this ministry. And on that, let me applaud every one of you. Thank you so very much for all that you do. In St. John chapter number 6, we have focused on the story that is set before us that talks about a young boy who was called by the scripture a lad. Simply called a lad. L-A-D. Didn't mention his name. Didn't call him any particular name. The scripture just simply classifies him as a lad. You know him as the boy with two fishes, small fishes we overlook sometimes, and five loaves of bread, or five barley loaves. John sets before us a great story with a very interesting and in-depth meaning. John sets before us the story of this young lad as he enters into the presence of the crowd and Christ and perceives that the presence of the Lord was among them. And so he offers up a poor boy's lunch because if you will study barley, barley in the scripture was a poor person's meal. 
So he offers up a poor boy's lunch in the presence of Jesus and says almost with his actions, if you can do anything with this, you're welcome to it. I like the way John put the story, and I'm paraphrasing it, until I get down into it and begin to talk to you from this story. But you got to understand that there were people who had come from villages and towns and all around from communities that had been following Jesus and hearing him teach and hearing him minister and watching him do miracles. And now here they are on this particular day and they had, as John says, become hungry. There was no store in that desert. There were no food lines around. There were no Walmarts. No Wally Worlds. No Sam's Club. No Wendy's. No Maccadies. Nowhere for them to get anything to eat. And all of a sudden, Andrew says to Jesus, there is a lad here who has two fishes and five barley loaves. But then all of a sudden, after Simon Peter said that, Philip bounced back and says, but what is there among so many? You've got 5,000 plus people here. And you've got a lad with two sardines and five crackers and you're going to feed 5,000? Not including, one scripture says, the men, the women, and the children. And then he had the audacity to say, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing be lost. Two sardines. No croakers. No black bass. No red snapper. No tilapia. No flounder. It wasn't even filleted. It just had that little one sobbing string probably running down the middle of it. Two sardines that wasn't even packed in mustard sauce. Doesn't even say anything about them having in the Texas Pete or Tabasco. You know, if you're going to eat sardines, you got to put a little hot sauce on it. And eat it with your crackers, amen. <laughs> And here the boy is with two sardines and five crackers. And they're talking about feeding 5,000, not including the women and the children. And then Jesus would have them to gather up the fragments. And they gathered up 12 baskets, which was over and above the meal that they started out with. Now we would take that story and get all happy about it, but that wasn't the whole significance of the story. Because when this young man perceived that he was in the presence of Jesus, he didn't mind giving up what he had. If a lot of us would understand that we are in the presence of Jesus and just give him what's rightfully his with our tithes and our offerings, he just keeps on making a way for us. And some of us who don't even have a way, if we just be willing to give Jesus what we have, he will add to it and make a way out of no way. Yeah. Here this young boy was, perceiving that he was in the presence of Jesus. And I want you to focus in on verse number 9 with me of the 6th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Let's focus on verse number 9 and let's read it together. John says, there is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Listen to what Andrew said. We've got a resource, but it's not enough. We've got a little small something, something, but it won't feed all of these folk. He asked, what is that among so many? But the significance of the point that I discovered in John chapter 6, after reading it over and over and over and over, you know, and over again, the significance of this whole thing is that he points out that there is a lad, a boy, 
a young fellow who is trying to teach us in this crowd that in order to perceive the presence of God, we must be in the right place. Help us, God. Forget the two fishes and the five loaves. Forget this is a poor boy's meal. And focus with me for a few minutes that John deemed it necessary that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, point out the fact that the lad was in the right place. Amen. Help us, God. He teaches us that in order to perceive the presence of God, that we must be in the right place. Oh, you may be in a good church, but are you in the right place? You may, all, you may be dressed up on the outside, but are you in the right place? Because see, if our frame of mind is not good, we're not in the right place place. Well, I'm a member of this church. I'm supposed to go to my church. But is that the right place? Amen. See, a lot of times people come into a particular place, but we don't come with the right frame of mind. We don't come with the right attitude. We don't come with the right heart. Amen. But when we bring all of it in line together and discover that that is the place where we need to be, then the presence of God begins to engulf us. Amen. Not that he's not already here, but sometimes we can't sense him or perceive him because we're not in the right place. Our thinking is out of order. Our perspective is out of order. Our hearts are left back somewhere before we got here to the church. Our mind is running ahead of us and where we're going to go when we leave the church. And sometimes that causes us not to be in the right place. You will know when you're in the right place because you will sense and perceive the presence of God. I like the way the scripture puts this in John when he says, there is a lad here. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you will recall from your basic elementary school grammar, that this little four-letter word, H-E-R-E, -E, here is an adverb. If I'm right, it's an adverb. And the thing about it is that it is the distinct duty and the job of every adverb to tell us something about the action of the sentence. It is the distinct duty, it is the job of the adverb to bring us some clarity on what is really taking place and going on in the sentence. Amen. It is supposed to tell us something about the action of the story. And when I read this one sentence, it didn't say a whole me about what was going on at this time and I had to read it over and over and over and then I had to look at the adverb H-E-R-E -E, to understand that there was something going on in the story that had to land where he was. I had to come to understand that what it is going to tell us about the action is where that action takes place. It wasn't even focusing so much on the boy. But it was talking about where the action really took place. See, I was about to get caught up in the fact that Jesus took two fishes and five loaves of bread, small fish, and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000, not including women and children, and then said, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing be lost. And I've been caught up on that for years. That, that blowed my mind. You take two sardines. We couldn't even do that in here. And five crackers and send all of y'all home full. That, that blowed my mind. I've been reading this story for a long time, preaching from it for a long time. And it literally blowed my mind that Jesus supernaturally 
naturally could do this and everybody got fooled and then he says, hey y'all clean up. Put in a basket, what's left? You didn't have enough to start with. How you gonna gather something up after that? But isn't that just like the Lord? To start with nothing and turn it around and make something out of it? Isn't that just like the Lord to take broken pieces and broken vessels and broken people and people who have been bad and starved by life who says that there is nothing left to my life and God takes us and blesses us and uses us and distributes us out to somebody else? Isn't that just like God? To take vessels that have been sick, that have been broken, that have been victimized by illnesses and God touch us in a special way and heal us Like God, take folk ain't got much money. Some of us don't have nothing but judgments against us, and our credit scores are out of this world. And God says, I still want to take you and use you for my glory. People that don't talk much, scared of crowds, shame of crowds, I'm embarrassed, I don't like to stand up before people and talk and God will put you on a platform and have you preaching to thousands, isn't that just like God? Folk who've been told you wasn't going to be nothing, your daddy wasn't nothing, your mama wasn't nothing, your family wasn't nothing, and you will never amount to anything and God takes us and do a little something with us, help us God, and then says I'm going to take you before kings and before nations. This adverb says to me that something was taking place in the story and it teaches us what was actually happening, but it tells us where the action takes place. That's the dramatical job of this adverb in the sixth chapter of John when he says that a lad is here. Where is here? Where is here? Here is where many of us are right now. Some of y'all sitting on your road looking just as cute as you can look. And don't really know where you are. The mere fact that you are here tells a story. That actor tells a story. You are here, but you had to come from somewhere. Help us God. And the reason some of y'all praise God like you do, because a lot of folk don't know where you came from, and they don't really know why you are here now. If it was left up to some folk, your advert would have never shown some folk why you were here. Because they thought that you had no business being here. And don't have backslid at any time, and then have your audacity to come back after you have backslid, and folk will look at you like you have no business being here. But your advert says something about you. Your advert says, excuse me, but I'm here because something happened in my life and my here is where I am right now. My here means I've been through the storm, but I'm here now. My here means that somebody kicked me to the curb, but I'm here now. My here means that the enemy tried to take me out, but I'm here now.
maybe branded it as 